Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Heather Galt, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at PMP Optica. We're really, really pleased that you can be with us today. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes um, before we get started on what you're here for, uh, just to give you a little bit of detail on what to expect today and uh, how the webinar will work. So, Danny, I'll ask you to move to the next slide. So what we're going to cover this morning uh, is a couple different things. We're going to start off by introducing you to PPO's smart imaging system and some of the core technology components that make that system work. After that, we'll move into some of the challenges specifically in working with poultry products um, and, uh, and talk a little bit about how PPO addresses those challenges and some of the applications that we are working specifically on in poultry today. And finally, I'm really pleased to be um, sharing with you that uh, Fieldale Farms is with us as well. And Corbett Kloster from Fieldale is actually going to share a little bit about how PPO is working with Fieldale on their Springer Mountain brand in the plant today. So Danny, if we can move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, some of the housekeeping items. So you'll see if you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and hopefully many of you have been on webinars either with us or others in the past, so this is all familiar, but you can see down at the bottom there's a black bar, and uh, in that bar there is a Q&A button. So if you have a question during the webinar, feel free to, um, to tap that or touch that button and um, add your question. I will see them as they come up. Um, and what we'll do is we'll hold them until the end and we will have a question and answer period at the end. If you want to chat uh, with everybody who's participating in the webinar, you can use the chat button, which is also in that bar along the bottom of your screen. And uh, just be aware that the chat does show up to everybody who's participating in the webinar today. Uh, we are recording the webinar, so if for some reason you um, miss a couple of minutes or would like to watch something again, or if you'd like to share it with your colleagues, that session recording um, will be available. We'll make sure that uh, it's available to you either upon request or on our blog, which you can find at ppo.ca slash resources. So all of our previous webinars, um, if you've missed them and are curious, uh, you can find them there as well as a number of other resources that may be helpful. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Danny, if we can move to the next slide. So we're going to start with Tim Stork, who's um, a product manager at PMP Optica. Uh, Tim will cover off the core technology and introduce you to our smart imaging system. And then he'll hand it to Danny, our product development specialist. Uh, and Danny will be the one walking you through um, how we manage the poultry specific challenges and uh, some of the applications that we're working on in poultry. And finally, Corbett Closter, who's the Director of Food Safety and Quality Assurance from Fieldale Fines, will talk about uh, partnering with PPO around their Springer Mountain brand. And I think with that, I will hand it over to Tim, who will start uh, sharing some information with you. So thanks again for joining us, and I will see you at the end. Hey, thanks for that intro, Heather. So as Heather said, I'm going to be going over some of the background um, just to give everybody a good idea um, and prepare them for some of the topics that, that Danny and Corp will be covering. So uh, I understand uh, not everybody has seen all of our past webinars. Um, so a, a brief intro to what is hyperspectral imaging, um, what does our hardware and our uh, PPO smart imaging system look like, as well as uh, what are some of our, um, the applications that we're in right now, and how do we build those applications and how do we build our software? So starting right in, um, our system is unique because we use hyperspectral imaging. So uh, just very quickly, we use a type of, uh, of hyperspectral imaging that uses reflectance of light. So um, what these images are showing basically is we shine light on a product, that light bounces off the product, and uh, inside of our spectrometers, we break that light into its different wavelength bands, and we capture that on our sensor. Um, so in a physical sense, what is happening is uh, when we shine the light on the product, uh, different energies of light and different colors are reflected differently. And we look at the ratio of those energies that are reflected back. And it's there where we can really uh, get a lot of chemical information and really help to fingerprint the chemistry of, of the samples we're looking at. So a little bit more on the next slide about, uh, about our systems uh, in specific. So um, we look at many, many wavelength bands and we have uh, the quantity and quality of our data is really leading the industry. So uh, up to this point, hyperspectral imaging hasn't been a big part of industrial processing, um, just because with the, with the sheer quantity of data, 
uh, 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been possible to do this live and on the line. Um, but nowadays, obviously, um, we can take this data, we can process it um, in a fraction of a second and make real online decisions um, with this, this data. So um, the, the ways that we differentiate ourselves from any other imaging technology is we, we see the full range of light, uh, light wavelengths. Um, we operate in the near infrared range, which is um, a really interesting wavelength range of light for looking at different food applications. And that's obviously our, our specialty in the industry. So moving on now to the, uh, to the hardware side of things. So uh, in the poultry ind industry specifically, we have a couple different versions of our PPO smart imaging system. So on the left, you can see a single-sided detector. Uh, this is the kind of machine that would be used for certain quality applications where you only need to see one side of the product in order to, um, in order to gather the data and do the application that you need. On the right-hand side, you see our double-sided system. So uh, we call this our Z configuration because of the orientation of the belt. But basically, we stack two detector modu modules vertically, and we flip the product in between as it cycles through, um, through that system. Uh, double-sided systems are generally needed for uh, any application where you need to see all sides of the product. So for material uh, detection applications would be a good example of that. All of our systems are uh, operating in the field, operating in the, in the poultry industry specifically, and have had a lot of testing done um, to make sure that they're uh, able to perform rigorously, stand up to sanitation in the food industry and uh, really meet the needs of our customers in this industry. Moving on to the next slide, uh, I'll cover a little bit of background about applications and, and what it means to see chemistry. So I talked about a little bit earlier, there's a huge variety of data we can see and really the, the scope of applications that we can address um, is, is absolutely huge. So, um, we, we get into new applications, new collaborations with partners all the time to try to figure out what are the new areas where uh, our system can be applied to look at uh, food safety or food quality, as well as automating existing tasks and other process control uh, optimization tasks. So a couple of major examples, uh, one on the next slide is in for material detection. So this is one of our, this was one of our first applications that we've really been uh, doing across a number of um, products and, and parts of the food industry over the years. So uh, in this image, I, I didn't want to use any poultry images because I didn't want to steal uh, Danny's thunder later in this presentation. But here's a bed of bacon bits with um, a variety of foreign materials around, uh, around three millimeters. So uh, there's a photo on the left, obviously a jumble, hard to make out anything in this visible photo. And on the right, you can see um, a visualization of what our, what our hyperspectral system would see. So basically we can train that system to pick out the individual materials uh, and any of these uh, would be found and rejected by the system. And the, the types of materials we can find really cover the gamut of, of what's needed in the industry. So uh, the color doesn't matter, the density of the material doesn't matter um, as, as those things do matter in other detection technologies. And that's really where we stand out in our detection performance. The next example, I wanted to give at least one example of a quality type measurement. So uh, this is a pretty straightforward um, example that looks at each pixel in the image and uh, we've trained it to tell the difference in composition. So uh, on the left again, we have a photo and on the right we have um, that colorized image based on the hyperspectral data. So here we take each pixel and we identify what is the percentage of uh, lean, and then we can average that over the entire image to say, um, here is the live uh, lean point of that sample. Um, there are many other quality applications that we've done as well, and I'll let Danny uh, go into more detail later on the uh, some of the uh, ones in poultry specifically. So the last background piece I'm going to talk about, moving on to the next slide, um, is just to touch on how we build our models. So. We've had entire webinars on, on data and building models, uh, but every application we build has to start with, with a machine learning model. And that's how we really um, have the confidence to say, yes, we can, we can do those things. So I'm gonna give an example of how we train a foreign material model. So 
it's a good way to think about it is to look at um, a, a machine learning algorithm in the same way as you would look at teaching a person. So you would need to show a person here are examples of what, uh, what you'd expect to see and what's acceptable, as well as what you want to reject. So um, in machine learning, we end up scanning. Uh, obviously, we don't want it to detect anything on the background belt. That's perfectly fine. Um, and we want to show it a lot of, of examples of good products so that it knows not to reject that. Then we teach it what all the foreign materials look like. And we do that in a number of ways. And Danny will go into the details about uh, some of the challenges around this process. The second part after we've trained models is to look at testing. So um, a machine learning model needs some feedback in order to be refined and to, to know it's moving in the right direction. And this is guided as well by our software, uh, software team at PPO. So um, there's two types of data. There's a uh, true positive data set, which helps to uh, refine the size and the accuracy of finding pieces. And then there's a false positive data set, which works to um, basically make sure that the algorithm is not finding foreign material where there is none. So uh, we give each new model these tests over time, and we choose the ones that pass the tests the best and score the best. And then we refine them and optimize them until both of these metrics um, are fine tuned to the right level. So uh, I think covering these core background topics will give Danny um, what he needs to talk about the next section. So I'll pass it over to him to talk about the specifics in the poultry industry. Thanks, Tim. So as you mentioned, I'll be talking about some of the talking through some of the challenges we faced and overcome with uh, imaging of chicken. Um, and then later on, move into some of the applications. So first, I'll go over uh, this general outline. So I'll be talking about things like the effect of uh, moisture and temperature difficulties in dealing with a variety of products and marinades and how we deal with imaging the underside of chicken. Uh, after that, I'll go over how we can help you with the automation of foreign material detection and optimization of various quality application processes. So let's start with the challenges involved in imaging chicken first. So uh, first off, hyperspectral imaging is pretty easily affected by moisture and temperature. These can end up affecting the spectra of the material. Uh, next, many processing plants may run a variety of different chicken products like tenders, wings, whole breasts, slice and dice products, and trim products. And each of those can have their own multitude of marinades. And so this variety makes imaging pretty complicated because uh, each product can end up reflecting the light needed uh, for our system in different ways. And this marination can end up obscuring the underlying chicken product or introduce new chemical signatures that might be present in the marinades themselves. So all this is pretty problematic because we want to provide some robust machine learning models. And for the models to be robust, they need to be able to properly deal with all these different uh, moisture temperature problems or all these variations in products. And so it doesn't make much sense to have a machine learning model that's only going to work for, say, whole unmarinated chicken breasts uh, when you know you need it to be working on, say, for example, chicken wings that could potentially be running on the exact same line. So to solve these problems, we need to uh, collect data to train our machine learning models to handle all these realistic situations. And to see what I mean by that, let's take a closer look at uh, how moisture and temperature affect this. So the near-infrared spectrum, or NIR spectrum, is very sensitive to water content. Since chicken's wet, any objects on the chicken will also end up being wet. And to illustrate what this means, let's compare some of the spectra for some dry materials shown in this figure on the left over here. Uh, and you can compare that with the same spectra for the same materials, but wet, which is presented in this figure on the right. So both these plots show the spectra for some materials like cardboard, wood, and various uh, plastics like rubber, polyethylene, and acetyl. But in the figure on the right, you'll notice there are several large dips near the right-hand side of uh, the plot. And so this is an indicator of the presence of water. So you can see it masks a lot of the spectra information that would be normally present uh, when a material is dry. And so this effect can be a lot more pronounced when the environment uh, is a lot warmer, for example, in the case where a, say, a cooking oven is in close proximity to our system. And so this warmer environment allows for more water to be suspended in the air. So the effects of 
uh, water on the masking and the spectral features can become more pronounced. And so just to help deal with these situations, what that means is we need to collect data on chicken at the right temperatures, right moisture levels, right humidity levels, uh, in order to give our system a more realistic uh, spectra for building these robust machine learning models. And in doing so, we just get one step closer to developing applications that are actually practical for use inside of a uh, poultry processing facility. So that was a look into the problem of uh, moisture and temperature and how we dealt with those. Um, next, we can look at how the variety of chicken products and marinades that we find in a processing plant can create some problems. So as mentioned, all of these different products can reflect light differently. So take this example of, uh, take this image of some various chicken parts. So you can imagine as light reflects off the surface of say a drumstick, the angle reflection isn't gonna be the same as when light reflects off of say one of the flatter parts of a chicken wing, for example. And all this changes the amount of light that a system sees, which is part of the information that gets fed into our machine learning algorithms. Uh, for marinated chicken, the challenge comes from the fact that marinades can coat the entire surface of the chicken. And any chemicals used in the marinades, such as starches, can end up masking the chicken's natural spectral signature. So this image on the right just shows some of the uh, some marinated chicken that we've made in our testing lab here at PPO. And this is based on a recipe that we've received from one of our customers. And it's pretty clear from the picture just how much of that chicken is covered in these marinades. Uh, now, it is quite difficult for us to source large quantities of all the marinades that are used in any one facility. So we often get assistance from our customers in collecting this data uh, when we're in the process of setting up a system with their plants. So this is just a brief video of what this uh, data collection looks like in a real customer facility. So here, a large batch of marinade chicken is just being run through uh, one of our systems. And in just a few minutes of data collection, we're actually able to get uh, data that would probably have taken us maybe tens of hours just to collect in our own test lab uh, back at PPO. And so this massive amount of data showing all the variety in chicken and in a real factory environment just makes our final machine learning models uh, that much better. And so this generally covers the biggest challenges we've faced when it comes to training our system. Uh, one other problem we've come across that's been more hardware related and less machine learning related is how do we actually image the bottom of something. So our system images things from a top-down point of view. So what do we do if something's hiding on the bottom? To solve this, we have a testing platform in our lab that lets us uh, examine different system configurations necessary for flipping uh, chicken. So we're able to test things like uh, different conveyor belt materials, belt speeds, transfer angles, and heights for the chicken uh, to drop before uh, landing on the second conveyor. So this video just demonstrates how our system uh, flips some chicken fillets. And in a real system, there would be one detector on the top belt to image the top side. Then following the flip, there would be another detector on the bottom belt uh, to image this newly exposed surface. Uh, so we would do this for mayonnaise that our customers help us identify as stickiest or the slipperiest ones so that we can test out some worst case scenarios. And this just helps us determine what we need to do to prevent chicken from sliding after it flips and to also make sure that the chicken doesn't get completely stuck to the belt and never release. So this is a pretty versatile testing system that helps us work out some of the issues involved in product transfer. And we use it for a variety of products like uh, pork chops or bacon bits or chicken wings. So talked a bit about the challenges we've had with imaging chicken. And so they're all necessary to solve in order to make a system with a machine learning model that could work in a real poultry processing facility. So the next few slides, I'll go over some of the applications that our system can handle. So these applications were all developed with input from poultry companies. So there's a big emphasis on a system uh, helping to automate or optimize existing processes. So we can start with form material detection first. So a big problem that companies face with form of material detection right now it's is that it's often done manually. So people very quickly lose concentration, which leads to uh, form materials getting past them and into finished products. So this figure, uh, this figure over here just shows that after about 30 minutes, uh, the probability of a person detecting an object during visual inspection uh, drops to about 50%. Machines on the other hand don't really get tired. They don't lose focus. So is a pretty good case for wanting to automate uh, this form material detection application. 
Now, as an example of how our system works in this area, let's take a look at some uh, random bits of uh, plastic or cardboard on uh, some of our chicken nuggets. So this image on the left over here is taken uh, with a normal DSLR camera, and the image on the right uh, shows a color map generated by our machine learning models just to illustrate how uh, these different format foreign objects are distinguishable from chicken. And the legend for the color map here is shown at the bottom. And so what's so impressive about this is that our system is able to pick out say this tiny piece of cardboard here on the top uh, on the top left nugget and this translucent piece of UHMW plastic on the bottom right nugget. So it's pretty hard to find those even if we're just staring at these still images. Um, now imagine trying to look for those on a faster moving conveyor belt that's also carrying uh, tons more nuggets and it's pretty easy to see why having uh, such an automated system is so important. A more specific foreign material that many of you may be more interested in is chicken bone. So chicken bone can be difficult to find with some automated systems because it's a fairly low density bone in comparison to say pork bones. But with our experience in spectroscopy and machine learning though, we don't really have any problems in detecting chicken bone, as you can see in these two images. So as with the previous slide, the image on the left over here is taken with a regular camera and the image on the right shows a color map generated by our machine learning models. So you can see these red marrowy sections of the bone here in this DSLR picture match up with those uh, red blob sections on the right image, which is just indicating where the bone is. Now, in addition to foreign material detection, our system does have the capability uh, to perform quality assessments. And so this will help you optimize these processes. So for quality uh, assessments, something like chicken tenderness, it's usually done as random. Uh, spot checks and there in those spot checks it's usually assumed that the randomly selected samples are representative of your entire batch of product running through your line. Now these measurements usually take quite a lot of time to perform so by the time you find out your chickens out of spec a bunch of poor quality products probably already made it to the end of your line. Uh, so to train our system to evaluate chicken breast tenderness we need to train it to associate these raw chicken spectra with uh, tenderness values that we measure with some industry standard techniques like the Warner Brassler shear force measurements. And so our system uh, is capable of performing these quality checks in real time on a piece by piece basis, uh, thereby is improving on the slower spot checking method. Uh, we do do something similar for woody chicken breasts as well. We train our system by scanning chicken breasts and telling it uh, if it's woody or not. It's then able to build that association of spectra to an assessment of woodiness. And so this video on the right uh, that I'll play just shows our system in action, scanning each individual chicken breast and rejecting it when it determines that it's showing some sign of woodiness. So this is just a little bit of an overview of the kind of work we do here at PPO. Our system uh, was designed to solve some real industry problems that poultry plants have shared with us. So do feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions on how we can help you in those areas. Um, and on that note, I'll pass things off to Corbin now to talk a bit more about what PPO and Field Dale have been uh, working on together to solve. So, good morning, you all. Uh, my name is Corbin Kloster. I work for a company called Field Dale Farms. We have a uh, our own brand that we sell under Springer Mountain Farms. Uh, PPO came to us to uh, initiate discussion about filing foreign material, and uh, which uh, I think is an industry issue, rubber gloves, plastic, that kind of thing. But that conversation really uh, ended up heading also into a quality issues such as identifying a woody breast. And, uh, and so basically that's what I'm going to talk to you about is trying to use this PPO vision system to uh, help us um, go through our, uh, help us with our quality uh, issues of, of identifying and eliminating or, or redirecting a woody breast. Uh, Springer Mountain Farms or, or Field Elf Farms is about, uh, it's a three, we have three established Three establishments that we work from. We have two slaughter and one for the processing. We kill about 140 million birds a year, plus or minus uh, 10 or 20 million. And uh, 
or a privately held company. Uh, we sell a niche product, mostly uh, grown on, uh, raising birds under various uh, grow out niches. We have uh, antibiotic free chickens. We have non GMO uh, fed, non, uh, no ingredients fed from non GMO, excuse me, no, no ingredients fed from GMO sources. We have an all vegetable diet. And we consider all these things to be a value added uh, element to our chicken. And so what we can't afford then is to is to have a value added product only to be rejected for quality issues, such as you will experience as we do experience by sending out woody breast to our customers. So identifying this this new uh, industry problem is a uh, is a, is a important aspect of our of our quality program. Uh, Woody Breast, for most of you out there who have worked with it or, or know of it, it's been around probably five or six years now, or at least uh, becoming more of an uh, industry uh, issue recognized by customer and, and marketing teams alike. Um, basically, if we get a complaint on our uh, quality, uh, we'll get a, a chewy or, or rubbery complaint uh, as opposed to just saying using uh, descriptive words as toughness. Uh, we hadn't seen the words chewy and rubbery that much until the woody breast issue started to arise. There's a, there's a taste issue. They'll say our chicken doesn't taste fresh or it has no taste. Um, and uh, it leaves a film in the mouth. Uh, people will talk about how uh, it, it leaves a, an oily film and, and if, if in contradiction to that, it also is dry and crumbly. So there's all kinds of negative aspects to supplying a ready to cook product out there and surprising customers with these uh, characteristics. So what we're asking PPO to do is to, is to help us um, with our automated system. So as employment, finding good employees becomes more and more difficult. Of course, we get more and more automated. And the speed and the repetitiveness of the work, of course, makes identifying this with the human eye, identifying human breast, or excuse me, woody breast issues with the human eye is more, is more difficult. So if we can get an automated system to help us do that, that would be great. And in doing that, we can try to ensure that we don't ship out these substandard quality products. Uh, a lot of times we'll have a free breast tray to our retail operations and only one breast will be bad. Um, also, if we can identify in advance, we can uh, utilize that woody breast maybe in a value added product that does not, uh, will not be as greatly impacted by the condition of the woody breast. So you can marinate it, you can grind it, put it in the, in the ground product. So, and I think we can do that and, and still meet ex customer expectations. So if we can, if we can sort it, we can better utilize it. But also by being able to collect it in an automated fashion and in a consistent fashion, we can control our process better and get better feedback to our live operations as they experiment or work with trying to solve whatever the uh, genetic or grow up conditions are with the woody breast even arriving in the facility. Of course, the woody breast thing is not a processing issue. It's a, it's a live bird supply issue. So once it gets to the plant, our, our, our response to it is really only sorting because we don't have a way to address it as, as far as a slaughter facility or, or a raw product um, problem. Uh, I have some slides to uh, show uh, for those unfamiliar with, with what the woody uh, condition uh, consists of. And it's because of these uh, visual elements and, and probably chemical elements that we are uh, hoping and feel confident that PPO can help us um, with this sorting operation. So um, if, if you'll bump me up a little bit there, Danny, these, uh, these are not slides that I've produced, but you can see here, these are histological slides, and you can see there uh, 
the ways that the muscle fibers deteriorate as the woody condition increases. And uh, of course, the chemical makeup of, of a woody breast is, uh, is different from that of a healthy, well-fibered uh, muscle. So under these microscope conditions, you can see that there hopefully is a, spec, uh, a spectrometric uh, signal there that can be read. Uh, go ahead, Danny. When we, uh, when we ask our sorters to go through these fillets, we do have a, we currently use a subjective method to determine the, uh, the level of woody breast that we're experiencing. And, and what this slide here represents is that scoring. So the slides are actually, the pictures are actually oriented in a counterclockwise fashion. A score of zero would be as a normal breast. We would hope all of our pipes would be that, uh, a score of zero. And then a score of one all the way through, through three is progressively um, worsening in regard to woody breast. So the things that score two and three, we would hope not to ship out to our, uh, to our customers, or at least uh, divert to another uh, processing method, as I stated, such as grinding or marinating or whatever. Uh, you can see some of the characteristics there with the raised ridge. The, the more woody it gets, the more prominent that, uh, that ridge there develops. You do get a little bit of color changing, but you can't really grade woody breast by, by breast color. You can have a, a range of colors and not necessarily, not necessarily have a woody breast condition. Uh, the term woody breast, I think, is, is well demonstrated in my last slide. So you can see there how the, how the scores of zero will droop. The, the meat is flexible and, and uh, the ridge is, is low. The meat's pretty uniform. But as we progress into a worsening woody breast condition, you can see how that meat becomes more rigid. It will not fold over that over the edge of that uh, crate that I've placed these breasts on. And eventually, they, they really just become uh, like a plank of wood. And, and we don't think any of our customers want to see that. So our employees, as they fill trays and they work in a, in a, a handling 85 to 90 breasts per minute, they don't have the vigilance. Uh, they don't have the capability to make these grading decisions. So if we can get EPO to help us do that for us, and it will be a success story for sure. Uh, currently, we have a PPO system in the plant. Uh, it's a single lane device. We've had it in the facility now for about uh, three weeks or so. And, and as Tim and Danny have stated, we're training the system now. So we will go through there and we will identify these uh, woody breast uh, fillets and butterflies and sort them according to our score. And as we send them to the machine, we will uh, we will identify what type of breast they've seen. And then that all goes back to PPO and they're building an algorithm to help us uh, uh, do what we have been discussing. So, uh, so far the machine is very easy to operate. We haven't had any issues operating it. The instructions are, are written out, and I think even a sixth grader could follow their instructions. So we're pretty happy with what we've seen so far, and, uh, and we're hoping for success once we get this, uh, this training, training of the machine finished up. And I think that's about all I have. Great. Thanks a lot, Corbett. And I guess just before I turn things over to Kevin, or sorry, back to Heather, um, I would just like to say uh, thanks to, to Danny and Corbett um, for helping us uh, talk about the poultry industry a little bit more. Um, and to reiterate that um, we have industrial systems that are, are running in this industry, and we're always looking for, for new um, partners and collaborators to help develop new applications. And uh, we're always looking for the next uh, way to help change the industry, to help automate something, to make the food safety better, the quality better, um, to optimize existing processes. So if anyone has any ideas about how to make that happen, we'd love to hear it. And uh, together we can make the next big thing. Uh, okay, Heather, I will turn it over to you for Q&A. 
Awesome, thanks so much, Tim. Um, so for those of you who have a question, please feel free to use the, uh, the little blob down at the bottom, the icon that says Q&A, uh, and uh, we'll do our best to get through all the questions that come in. I've got one here that's already come in, um, which is curious to see if the system can measure 3D size dimensions relative to spec. So Tim, I'll leave that one to you to answer if you could, please. Absolutely. Um, so we've, we've actually looked into this a little bit uh, and, and, and thought about it a little bit. So um, the way that our data is structured, um, we get to see two spatial dimensions because we're looking from a top down always. Uh, so two spatial dimensions, and then we have all the spectral chemistry information. So uh, you could think about measuring the volume of something if you had enough camera angles uh, in order to to do the math and say it's this dimension in height, this dimension in width and length. Uh, so we have to be a little bit more creative about how we do that. Um, we, can't, we can't determine absolutely what the height of the product is. We need to use, try to use our chemistry information for that. Um, that doesn't mean we can't deduce something about the volume of that product, um, but we will always need to combine information about the surface area that we can see from the, the sides, sorry, from the top, as well as um, the spectral information that we're seeing from the top. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Um, I think I'm going to stick with you again for a minute. There's another question here. What is the capacity of the equipment, either in pounds per hour or pieces per minute? That's a great question. So uh, currently our applications, uh, depending on the customer, go from 15,000 pounds an hour uh, all the way up into, I think, 30,000 pounds and above. Uh, obviously, the more product that you put through our system, because we are mostly a surface inspection uh, system, um, depending on the application, uh, in terms of a foreign material application, there'd be more uh, places for foreign material to hide between pieces or underneath pieces. But um, for certain quality applications, uh, we can run at, at very high, uh, high throughputs as well. Um, our belts themselves generally run between about 60 and 85 feet per minute. Uh, and certain applications, we can run over 100 feet per minute, depending on, uh, on what we're looking for. Awesome. Thank you. Danny, I think I will give this one to you. Since you can't see inside the product, have you done any work in fully cooked sliced products to see bone or other foreign materials coming off the slicer? And Tim, feel free to jump in too. Um, fully cooked bone product. So we have done that and I feel like it's a bit easier for, um, so there's slight differences between raw bone and fully cooked bone in chicken products, just because once you cook it, you're going to introduce some new chemical changes. Um, but of course with our system, it needs to, I mean, the bone needs to be exposed. So, I mean, that's kind of the, um, one thing to keep in mind is if, if the bone is somehow embedded deep inside the chicken breast, that's even if it's cooked or raw, it's, it's going to be hidden from your system. And just, just to chime in, we, we have definitely taken, taken images of cooked product and I can picture exactly what we're talking about, about breast slices. And there's those ready to eat breast slices you can buy in the grocery store. So absolutely. If we can, if the foreign material is going to be on the surface, whether that is bone or any of the other foreign materials, um, we can perform foreign detection or foreign material detection on that product. Awesome. Thank you so much. So one more question here is, um, can you expect inspect things like ingredients or flavoring, breading, that kind of thing? Is that possible as well as uh, inspecting the, the poultry products themselves? Tim, I think either one of you can probably okay. answer that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we, we're not limited to the, to the meat industry. Um, so we've had some talks with, with, um, potential customers who are interested in imaging a whole, whole wide variety of things. So, um, that can be looking at ingredients that can be looking at produce that can be looking at, um, whatever the material is. And we, we work with, um, with these customers to understand what is the form of material they're looking for? Uh, what is the range of the products that are acceptable? And then how can we best display those products to our detectors to make sure we can, um, we can statistically have a good chance of seeing what, what we hope to find. 
Okay, and Corbett, this one's for you. How will field ale measure success of the equipment? Is it too early to have with the equipment in place for only three weeks to discuss results? Is it working to remove woody brush? Uh, we haven't had a chance yet to actually put it in line because we still are in the very early stages of training it. If we can, uh, particularly our trade pack facilities, if we can stop us from packing uh, woody breath, especially the severe, because like I say, you can't really judge it by color, but if we can stop from putting a, an oddball filet in a tray of chicken, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll consider that to be pretty successful. Because, uh, as I say, we're privately held and we do a lot of private labeling, but Springer Mount Farms, with our other claims, is a pretty, uh, we're pretty proud of it. And we don't want to lose that customer from uh, the eyeball fillet that they get. So if we can, if we can eliminate even 80% of, of anything we hear back from the customer, we would probably consider that successful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corbett. I don't see any additional questions coming through, and I see we're closing in on a quarter to the hour. So I think at this point, we oh, one more question came through. <laughs> Always try and do that. So uh, we'll take this as our last question. How does the system perform in regards to bone detection accuracy versus the standard x-ray system that would currently be in use? So Tim or Danny? Sure, I can take that. Uh, so I'd say x-ray systems work obviously in a different way than our system. Our system is mostly a surface detection technique compared to x-rays, which will uh, do a different job, but do it in volume. So. Um, when we train our systems, we're going to be training it on the, the type of bone that we're interested in. We can also train it on cartilage, which, uh, of course, density is what x-ray looks, looks at. So I'd say for pieces that are on the surface, um, PPO's hyperspectral imaging is probably going to give you better performance. Um, we can see fairly small pieces down to, uh, I think generally we say pretty confident around three millimeters, um, and that's including bone and, and cartilage. Uh, I'm not super familiar with, with every x-ray out there, um, but of course the benefit of an x-ray is that you can see, see in volume of product. Awesome. Thank you. So I think with that, we will wrap up for today. Thank you all so much for being part of this. Um, I do want to let you know that we are in the process right now of uh, planning an additional webinar with another client um, of ours. So you'll be able to hear a few more examples um, in the poultry space. And we are also looking at uh, building some for those of you who may have products in other proteins. Uh, we're building some additional webinars as well. I'll remind you that uh, all of our webinars will be posted on our blog on our resources page. So ppo.ca slash resources and uh, we'll follow up with you tomorrow I think with uh, a copy of the uh, the link to the recording so thank you again so much for being part of this if you have questions that we didn't get a chance to answer today please feel free to reach out to um, your sales representative from PPO and we'll hope to see you again on a future webinar thanks so much and thank you so much to our speakers today Tim Danny and Corbett have a great day bye for now